Perfect. Welcome, folks. Thank you for joining our webinar hosted by the Environmental Policy Innovation Center, the Ecological Restoration Business Association, and the Environmental Law Institute. Uh, we can go to the next slide, and I'll run through a couple housekeeping items before we get into an intro and overview of today. Uh, first, just ask folks to please use the Q&A feature uh, below to ask any questions, and we'll do our best. We're going to be trying to answer some of those uh, as the session is underway, and if there are any that uh, questions that come to the top that we want to discuss, we'll save those for our panel discussion at the end. By participating in today's webinar, you are um, consenting to having the webinar recorded. So uh, just think about that when, when asking different questions. And if you have any technical assistance questions, uh, please message uh, Lena, who is on here, and she has the, the L uh, over here uh, up on her screen. So please reach out to her with any uh, technical difficulties, and we'll do our best to help out. So what we're going to do today is uh, hopefully you've you've taken a peek at the uh, the time it takes for restoration, which is a review of mitigation banking instrument timelines, review of those and uh, time to to implement and ultimately approve those. We're going to first have an overview of that research effort from uh, our two researchers, uh, Becca Madsen at Epic and Steve Martin, a mitigation specialist with Irba. Then we'll walk through some panel reactions, which will be from a host of different perspectives, including mitigation banker, um, the, the Army Corps of Engineers and EPA, who we're both very grateful to have those agency partners on. And then we'll open it up to uh, group Q&A. So um, do keep in mind those, those questions and um, feel free, you can submit them through the Q&A and we'll get to them uh, at the end there. I think we can go to the next slide now. Great. Well, I wanted to first just offer a little bit of an intro of who Urba is. We're the Ecological Restoration Business Association. Uh, some of you may know us as the National Mitigation Banking Association, which we formerly were, and we still are very much focused on the mitigation banking program because we've seen the great success it's produced over the years, and we want to see it succeed uh, and be able to apply those skills to other new markets and environmental restoration opportunities. Uh, just a bit of a recap on, on Urba. We're a trade association. We have members located across the country, uh, and we've been uh, formed over 20 years now. Uh, and worked very closely with the agencies on the lead up to adoption of the 2008 rule. And then now the 15 plus years that we've seen of uh, trial and error going through implementing the rule and seeing where those successes are and where there's still room for collective improvement across sponsors as, as well as agencies. We are an advocacy organization, so we're very focused on policy recommendations, of course, but we also look at uh, just opportunities to improve implementation. I think a lot of what we'll cover today with this MBI report review and then the recommendations at the end, they're, they're all things that could be done uh, even through training um, and just better cooperation and communication between agencies and, and sponsors, URBA members of these projects. So much of what we do is also just advocating for that training, the staffing. We separately have an effort focused on a best practices forum. And uh, we also try to always promote in any of our policy recommendations, any of our policy recommendations, uh, a set of principles of ecological restoration. So you'll see those themes of durability, uh, equivalency coming through any of, of the recommendations that we're making. And then we also, again, we're looking at uh, what are what are those lessons learned from the mitigation space, and then how can we apply those to new resource programs? So uh, we see a lot of success that that has been accomplished to date, and we love to see that integrated uh, to to move towards multi benefit and multi purpose projects if we can get through some of these log jams and reviews. So what was 
the motivation leading to this particular report effort, uh, there was kind of two policy themes happening in the background. The, the first was just seeing the infrastructure, uh, the, uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law coming out, and obviously the need to have readily available offsets to permit the, those projects, uh, but also this theme that's evolving around cutting green tape generally and just trying to speed up permitting for any projects that are good for the environment. So why why is it taking us so long to review these mitigation banks that ultimately are providing ecological uplift? Uh, so so that was the the background. From there, Urba issued back in April of 2021, we issued a recommendation on a regulatory guidance letter that would focus on IRT roles and responsibilities. Uh, we were hoping to see the core adopt some aspects of that in forthcoming guidance. So uh, maybe we'll we'll hear from them on that some. Uh, and any of these recommendations that we make, though, we we want to see them be data backed, evidence based findings. And so that was the need to move from just talking about anecdotes on how the timing looks for mitigation bank projects and and move to this national data set, which. Uh, we've we've started to do with um, with this MBI report. I do want to just take a moment to acknowledge uh, that the report is, of course, it's a it's a snapshot in time. It's based on the data that uh, was available in ORM, so it it isn't telling the full picture of the current backlog of projects, and and we're aware of that, and that's something that. Uh, you know, we'll we'll provide context on as as we're moving forward and thinking about the next phase of research or um, even some of the recommendations coming out. So with that, uh, I want to turn it to our main presenters, uh, the researchers behind this report. And first, I'll introduce uh, Becca Madsen. Perfect. Uh, Becca is with the Environmental Policy Innovation Center. She works at the intersection of natural resources and economics, applying her master's in environmental management degree to projects like analyzing biodiversity offset programs and identifying opportunities to tap into data science to solve environmental issues. Her current work with EPIC is focused on identifying and advocating for opportunities to speed and scale environmental restoration outcomes through policy change. And then second, we're gonna be hearing from uh, Steve Martin, who is a retired regulator and environmental scientist with the Army Corps of Engineers. He has worked with compensatory mitigation, including mitigation banks and in fee programs since 1995. So Steve has seen it all in the full evolution of the program. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it first to Becca. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so, so EPIC uh, Environmental Policy Innovation Center, we're interested in restoration, and we really want to make sure that restoration outpaces environmental damage. Um, and today, right now, that's not necessarily the case. It can take a really long time to get restoration projects approved, um, and we'd like to see that faster because we're just impatient. <laughs> and as uh, Sarah mentioned, there is this once in a generation investment in the nation's physical and natural infrastructure with the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, or IIJA, and this will need mitigation. Um, so many of these projects, um, although they're great in fixing our crumbling infrastructure, um, they will be crossing streams and wetlands and rivers, and those will have impacts. And so according to the Clean Water Act, after avoiding impacts to these aquatic resources and minimizing them, um, there must be compensatory mitigation for any leftover damages. Um, so we wanna see that restoration in place quickly so that it can be used <laughs> for these projects. Um, and as well, this money has a, has a bit of a time frame. It's a use it or lose it by 2026. And some of that money is going to restoration. So even these restoration projects can take a very long time to approve. So we just wanna see all of this speeded up. So compensatory mitigation under this 2000 rule, as we like to call it, or compensatory mitigation for the losses of, of aquatic resources um, can be achieved through permanent responsible mitigation, mitigation banks, or in lieu fee programs. And within the regulations, um, there's a part that talks about the approval process for mitigation banks and in lieu fees. And in that part, 
there's mention of how long it's supposed to take for different parts of the process. And you add up all those little pieces and it comes out to 225 days. Now, as Sarah alluded, we've heard anecdotally um, that that's not being met, um, but there hasn't been a quantitative analysis. There has been some interviews that have been done by Environmental Law Institute and Rebecca Kisslinger will be on a little later and she can mention that if she'd like to, um, but there hasn't been a quantitative analysis. So Urba and Epic uh, submitted a FOIA to the Army Corps of Engineers to access the ORM database. And you get points if you know what that stands for. Um, <laughs> but basically it's the database that tracks uh, wetland and stream permits along with other things. And it does include, um, importantly for our research, timestamp data of when, um, when a project proposal came in, when it's going through different phases of the process and when it's finally done. So we wanted to take that data and categorize it into these three categories at the bottom. The mandatory federal processing category is the time on the regulator's desk. It's what rolls up to that 225 day deadline. The rest of the time does not roll up to that required deadline, but it's still important. So another part of the process is what is on the desk of the sponsor, um, the sponsor of the mitigation bank or the in lieu fee program. And then there's a, a category we just call additional processing because you can't distinguish between whose desk it's on. And because I know there's experts on the line or, or people who like to nerd out on it, uh, the detail for that is it's the time between uh, when a prospectus is received and when it's deemed complete by the Corps of Engineers and when a draft instrument is received and deemed complete by the Corps of Engineers. So that's what that means. So we collected this data through the FOIA. Um, we did have to winnow some data records out. Um, and that was uh, primarily due to some inaccurate data entry that we saw in the records where there was either four or more of the same timestamp, which is a little dubious, um, or there was um, some blanks in, in the records so that we couldn't really analyze that. We also took out any records that started before the 2008 rule started because then the time frame wouldn't apply to it. Um, and we did, um, per recommendation from an academic colleague, we took out the outliers at the first and the 99th percentile. Now it turned out that it didn't make a big difference, but we wanted to check that anyway. One last step that we took is to try to compare the data that we see in the ORM database that we had from the FOIA and the data that is publicly available on this Ribbits platform. And I hope you guys have seen this before, um, but it does cover uh, mitigation banks in Luffy programs. And we, when we compare the two and see, okay, here's our data set over here with mitigation banks, here it is with Ribbits. Um, it compared pretty well with mitigation banks, but you can see um, there's a lot of missing in Luffy programs, or there's a lot of differences between the data that we received in the FOIA and the data that's on Ribbits. So for that reason, we decided to focus primarily our analysis on mitigation banks. So our primary resource question is really going to that 225 day deadline. And then we, we thought, what else can we ask of the data? <laughs> what kind of questions can we answer? And these are some of the research questions and I'll go through these. So that primary question, you know, is the 225 day, day requirement being met for the federal mandatory processing part of the piece. <laughs> is that being met? No, it isn't. And that's statistically significant. Um, the color in gray here on that little calendar is the 225 days it's supposed to take. The pink is the additional time that it is taking on average nationally. And as this note mentions, we, we think this is probably an underestimate as a lot of the data records don't sort of start that little timestamp until the prospectus is complete. But that's not the whole picture. Um, so in total, it takes around three years and, and change to process a mitigation bank instrument. And that's including the blue, uh, the sponsor processing and the green additional processing where the application documents are going back and forth between uh, the regulator and the applicant. We also wanted to know um, if maybe there was a bottleneck in the process, if there was one particular stage in the process that was taking the longest. 
And what we found is that the final instrument stage was taking longer than the 45 days that was required. And the other two stages, the prospectus and the draft instrument, um, on average nationally, they were meeting the 90 days um, for that requirement for the pieces of that 225 days. <laughs> Um, and then we also wanted to know if maybe there was a COVID bump um, where applications were taking a lot longer during, um, during COVID or things like that. And what we did find is, is no, that wasn't the case. Um, and here, what we're doing is we're adding um, the mandatory federal processing in green, and we're adding the sponsor processing in gray and the additional processing in blue. So you can see the mandatory time and then the total time there. So there was one year where on average, uh, the 225 day deadline was being met. That's that red line, um, which I believe this is showing medians. And so that little star is the average. Um, but then we also were looking for trends and we didn't really see trends over time of, of application processing getting faster or slower, either for the mandatory part or for the whole part. And so, at this point, I will turn it over to Steve. We're gonna see whether there are differences in districts. So Steve, take it away. Okay, thanks, thanks very much, Becca. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so what you're seeing here are uh, the records, the, the count of uh, banks following that uh, cleaning process that Becca mentioned. Uh, on the left, you see uh, districts listed in reverse alphabetical order and the number of banks that each of those districts approved. On the right, they've been ordered in terms of numbers of banks. Uh, what's really striking to me, uh, St. Paul District made up almost a quarter of all the banks that were approved in that uh, eight-year period. And if we take St. Paul, New Orleans, Wilmington, Vicksburg, and Norfolk and add them together, it's more than half of all the banks. Next slide, please. So this chart depicts uh, average or mean mandatory federal processing times for 35 core districts for that eight year period. Uh, the chart is ordered by average mandatory federal processing time. Uh, the shortest processing is at the bottom of the chart, the longest at the top. That uh, red vertical line represents 225 days of mandatory federal processing uh, in accordance with the 2008 mitigation rule. Uh, each district has its own box plot. And in the middle of each of those box plots, the black vertical line uh, is the median value. The red X is the mean. Also, uh, after the name of each district is the number of banks approved in that eight-year period uh, by that district. Uh, and it's important to note that six districts had average federal approval times of less than 225 days. Uh, those are the ones listed on the, on the left-hand side of the screen. Okay, next slide, please. All right, what you're looking at here uh, is plots of the mean and standard deviation of total mandatory federal processing for those 16 districts that approved more than 10 banks in that eight year period. Uh, the blue bars are means, the green bars are standard deviations. Uh, they're ordered from lowest standard deviation on the left to highest standard deviation on the right. Uh, the districts, uh, the, the six districts further to, furthest to the left, starting with Mobile, ending with Wilmington, uh, had standard deviations of less than one half the mean processing value in that particular district. This suggests much less variability in processing of those banks within those districts. Uh, another way to think of this might be that those districts uh, may have more consistency in processing banks, uh, which suggests perhaps more predictability for mitigation providers. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, the past couple of slides talked about mandatory federal processing. In this particular chart, 
we've plotted mandatory federal processing in green, followed by sponsor processing in gray, uh, and then additional processing in blue. And we've ordered them from uh, shortest overall processing time on the bottom to longest at the top. And to me, what's really remarkable is that some districts like Wilmington, Rock Island, and Pittsburgh appear to have minimized that additional processing. That is the back and forth between the sponsor and, a, and the core before uh, a product, a prospectus or a draft instrument is considered complete. Next slide, please. All right, we're gonna shift gears a little bit and go to uh, ILF program data. Next slide, please. As Becca indicated earlier, we set aside ILF project data uh, that we got out of WARM because it was incomplete. It depicted far fewer ILF project sites than we found in Ribbits. Uh, this reflects different approaches among districts in entering ILF project data in WARM. However, data for ILF programs in Ribbits agreed with data for ILF programs in WARM. So we could conduct uh, an analysis on that smaller uh, data set. What you see here are box plots comparing ILF and bank processing for mandatory federal sponsor and additional processing. And you can see that federal and sponsor processing are very similar. Uh, obviously the number of banks is so much greater uh, then in Luffy programs, uh, we wind up with a lot of banks in the fourth quartile. Next slide, please. And this table compares bank and ILF program processing in terms of mean and median processing. Mean processing times for banks and ILFs appear at first glance to be pretty similar. However, on average, ILFs took a bit more than two additional months of overall processing. The median processing for banks was more than nine months shorter than for ILFs. The mean additional processing timeframe for banks was nearly nine months. For ILF programs, it was nearly 12 months. Next slide. So basically, uh, as Becca had indicated, the overall 225 day mandatory federal processing time uh, is, is not being met across districts, although there are a number of districts that are meeting that time frame. The total processing average is nearly three years. Uh, some, uh, as I said, some districts met the 225 day standard uh, for at least 25% of the banks. Most did not. We discovered a number of incomplete, inconsistent data issues. Uh, certainly, uh, ILF project data entry was one of those issues. Uh, the timestamp data was another issue. Uh, we had bank records with uh, negative timelines, uh, bank records that were initiated and approved in one day, uh, a, a lot of glitches of that nature. Uh, I, at the bottom of the slide, you have a link to the report itself, and I would direct you to the appendix. There's a lot of very useful data in the appendix to the report. One more. Next slide, please. So we took the recommendations, and each of us picked our top uh, three. Mine, uh, additional time frames that back and forth between districts and sponsors uh, is somewhat problematic. Uh, on average, this is nearly nine months of mitigation bank processing. And while it might be possible to insert tags to better detect when the core is actually processing and when it's in the sponsor's hands, uh, it's worthwhile looking at districts like Wilmington, Pittsburgh, and Rock Island, which have minimized average additional processing. The question is, how have they accomplished that? This quantitative analysis does not point to that. Uh, the next recommendation, mission success criteria 5.1, indicates that an appropriate target for district approval of banks and ILFs 
is 550 days of federal and sponsor processing. It seems to me that including sponsor processing is somewhat unrealistic. A federal agency can't control or manage sponsor processing, such as resolving title issues, uh, developing feasible mitigation work, maintenance, or long-term management plans. I'd recommend instead focusing on that 225-day mandatory federal processing period. Uh, finally, for me, we noticed market disparities between bank information in ORM and Ribbits. Often banks shown as approved in ORM had not yet been marked approved in Ribbits, or dates of prospectus differed markedly between ORM and Ribbits. We also found a number of banks in ORM that were not in Ribbits and vice versa. Uh, the two data sets should be synced periodically to ensure data in each is consistent with the other. Uh, Becca, time for your three. All right. So my very top one is as an analyst and as someone who is interested in adaptive management and not just saying it's wrong, um, but why is it wrong and what can we do about it, um, is that there is a delay code that is available in the ORM database, and it could be used by staff to indicate why there might be a delay. Um, so as an analyst, I would have loved to have seen, okay, here's the factors that are contributing to delays, or maybe they're different in different districts. Um, so that would really help. Um, I think we've all used forms online and had times when uh, we tried to enter it and it said, no, you've, you've done something wrong, go back and fix it. So I think something like that could really also help a lot of the data errors that we were seeing. Um, and I think our analysis using uh, the R programming language is sort of a proof of concept of saying that you can create a script that is re-runnable um, and be able to automate uh, reporting on the 225 day timeline. So those are our top recommendations. Uh, so we're the analysts, the researchers, and we're gonna sort of turn it over to a panel uh, to comment on this. So I'm turning it over to Rebecca Kisslinger with Environmental Law Institute. And she has done previous research on um, approval timelines uh, through interviews. And so she's got a little bit of background uh, more from the human context, and I'm gonna turn it to you to moderate. Awesome. Thank you so much, Becca. And thanks, Becca and Steve. Thank you for inviting me today. Thank, thanks to you all for participating. I'm really looking forward to this panel to discuss the results we just heard. So my name is Rebecca Kisslinger. As Becca said, I'm the Senior Science and Policy Analyst at the Environmental Law Institute, and I direct our wetlands program. For those of you not familiar with ELI, we're a nonprofit law and policy research and education organization. We're based in Washington, DC. We've been around just over 50 years. Our wetlands program provides timely balanced information on wetland law, science, policy, and management through research, education, and convenings. For decades, we've been working with state and federal agencies and providers to help improve the implementation of compensatory mitigation. Um, most recently, we've been working within the fee programs to improve implementation. We've analyzed the state of stream compensatory mitigation with partners, and we've created resources that provide um, guidance on certain components of the 2008 compensatory mitigation rule, including the watershed approach and long-term management. And we currently have a project looking at climate change and compensatory mitigation. So as Becca mentioned, in 2020, we published a report looking at some of these issues we evaluated opportunities, challenges, sticking points, and some best practices for regulators, IRTs, and providers on the review and approval process of proposed compensatory mitigation in banks and in the fee programs and projects. Our report, based on interviews with agencies and providers, outlines a number of challenges in the implementation of review and approval from both the agencies and providers' points of view. Um, we try to identify some best practices that might inform future implementation. So this report was a real high level, again, look based on what we what we heard from interviews, so anecdotal information. Um, but we outlined some of the important issues, and now Becca and Steve have really fleshed those out with some real data on how long the process actually is taking. And it's really extremely important and exciting to identify some of these challenges and provide some meat on the bones to some of these challenges. So I'm really excited to be part of this webinar to discuss the findings. 
Um, and our panel today is going to react to and add some context to what we just heard from Becca and Steve. We're going to discuss challenges and, and the opportunities behind those numbers. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce the panel and then we're going to have them talk. Um, so first we have Greg DeYoung. Um, he's the co-founder of Westerbelt Ecological Services. Greg has four decades of experience in planning, environmental review, wetland mitigation, and endangered species conservation. His background includes permitting of mitigation and conservation banks and large scale mitigation projects in the West, the Rocky Mountains and the Southeast. He is the Vice President Emeritus of Westervelt and he currently serves as the President of Urba. Then we have Brian Topping. Brian has worked at US EPA since 2004 in the Clean Water Act Section 404 Regulatory Program. He's been the National Program's lead for programmatic tracking and reporting and stream mitigation for more than 10 years. And finally, we have Tom Walker. He's currently the acting chief of the Army Corps regulatory program. Previous to this assignment and since 2011, he was the chief of the regulatory branch at the Norfolk District. He's also spent 16 years as project manager and supervisor in the Wilmington District in North Carolina, both um, working in both mountain and coastal environments. Tom has worked extensively in the preparation of environmental impact statements, records of decisions, and conditional permit approvals for large-scale projects, including beach nourishment, water supply, and industrial sites. He received his master's in biology with a concentration in coastal and estuarine ecology from East Carolina University. So welcome to our panel. Um, I guess we can all come, come back on camera, the panel, and I'm gonna ask um, that you all um, I'm going to ask a question, first question of you all and, and ask if you can react to what you just heard um, from Becca and Steve, uh, what your top takeaways are based on that research and, and what you'd like to see next. So um, I'll start with you, Tom. All right. Thanks, Rebecca, and thanks for having me here today. And um, thanks for this information. Um, I think my reaction is, unfortunately, it's no real big surprise. Uh, if you recall, some of you may have been at the Urba conference back in the fall in D.C. where I spoke, and, and I mentioned there that we had done our own analysis of data just looking at the mission success criteria that Steve mentioned over time for the past several years and found that while our target is between 70 and 75 percent of banks within 550 days, we were usually averaging around 30. Um, so so we understand there's work to be done. Uh, the takeaway from this is I think we all have work that can, we can do to make these timelines better. And, and that's you know, where we're focused now on, on what we're implementing. Uh, we spoke to a few things there at the conference in, in the fall, and, and I've, I've got an update I can give you guys here today of, of kind of how some of those um, projects have progressed. So looking forward to, to, to digging further into this. Great, uh, Brian. Thank you. Uh, thanks again for having us uh, join and, and for producing this report. Absolutely echo those, those sentiments. And uh, it's great to see a review that, that digs in um, and looks at the approval times and breaks them apart by the, the categories of approval time. And actually just, just seeing the presentation today really one of the things that popped out to me um, that I hadn't seen earlier was really looking at how much the the sponsor's approval time. We've always heard sometimes that varies and that can take a lot of time, but how that was kind of a little bit larger usually in the means at least than uh, the federal approval time. Of course, having that additional approval time, not knowing where it allocates, that could, could change all of that. But seeing uh, you know how much that that plays in and how consistent that is in a in a large chunk of time um, in the process uh it, it's also though you know the report and and as tom mentioned it's not a, a big surprise that there's room for improvement um you know we always are, are looking for those room for improvement and and hopefully this kind of analysis you know broken down in the granular faction uh that that becca and steve pointed to especially at the district level will hopefully help us find, you know, where to look for those practices that we want to see how it's, how is it working so well? What can we learn from those? Um, and, and where perhaps in the process we should look to, to, to focus our efforts in terms of developing additional resources or tools or trainings 
um, to, to help this whole process go more efficiently, efficiently and get the results we want to see. So thank you. Awesome. Greg, your thoughts? Yes, thanks. I, I, I'll say that my overall reaction was one of relief <clears throat> and and appreciation for everybody involved, Steve and, and Becca, you know, as lead authors, thank you so much. Relief because we've been stuck, I think, and and I, I won't say whether it's mostly sponsors or agencies, but I think we've been stuck in, at the level of anecdote for quite a long time. And I almost thought, Steve and Becca, that maybe you could just, uh, as a subtitle, call this Beyond Anecdote, because I think that's that's really the value that you're bringing here. And I think, you know, anecdote or telling our stories is can be cathartic, but I think we've been stewing in those juices for an awful long time. And I, and so I really appreciate it. I had a boss that once said he would, this was, was his management style. He'd come to you and he'd say, what is it time for now? He really put you on the spot. And, and it was so valuable because it made you stop and think about how you're using your time. And uh, Steve and Becca, I think it is time for this. It, it has been time for this report. And, and I think it's now time for the follow-up that your report speaks to. And I'd also like to thank the, the other panelists and, uh, and also the audience members. The amount of expertise that's represented today is, is pretty impressive. So if it's okay, I'd like to talk about four points, my main four points to the reaction to the study. I, oftentimes I've read that uh, an audience can only remember three points, but I'm gonna push us a little bit. I'm gonna, I'm gonna cover four points. So I, I'm gonna talk first about, I, I'm just gonna list the four points. So the first one, and then I'll go back and speak to each of them a little bit. The first one is, I think a big part of the value of the report is what it was unable to tell us. And I think the report is very clear about those data limitations. That what it can't tell us really is a roadmap for us to, to go forward and, and to use this report as a springboard. That's point number one. Point number two is that, um, that um, the additional processing time stole the show. That was a major uh, interesting finding for me. Number three is that the sponsor processing time is significant. And Brian, you mentioned that as well. And then finally, I want to talk just a little bit about the fact that mitigation bank establishment and ILF establishment, it, it's a team sport. So I want to talk about those four things. So first, the value of the report is what the data could not answer. Um, and, and one of those is, why? Why is it working? Why, why is mitigation bank review and establishment working really well in some districts, but not as much in others? And the report mentions that uh, timeliness of review is not related to the number of banks. And I found that to be really interesting. So does that mean that we're, we are or we're not looking at a staffing issue? Why is it that, that some districts could review more banks and do it in a timely fashion. So I think that's just one item I, that I think we need to look into. Then number two, in terms of additional processing times, as Steve mentioned, additional uh, processing time is three quarters of a year. It's longer than the, man, the mandatory federal processing time. So that really is, that was a shock to me and, and really interesting. Because of the, the data limitations, that additional processing time is some amalgam of agency and processing time. We need to know what that is. We need more definition about what is that. We can't even tell who had the document from this data. We can't tell who had the document at any, any given time and for how long. I do know, and I think uh, sponsors have talked about this for years, that this additional processing time can be a black box, sometimes it's hard to get information about what's happening. And I think that might work both ways. I think we can all do better at managing that piece of the process. Years, a few years ago, the Urban Board got together and we tried to look at what we would recommend if the 2008 rule were, uh, were up, was, was to be updated. And one of the things that we came up, one of the few 
critical things would be more clarity on what it means for a document to be complete and uh, and and timelines on when that completeness determination should be made because we get into this iterative process there aren't timelines associated with that and so that could be part of this additional processing time and some Brian I'm sure you'll speak to this but I think the EPA workbooks and and checklists could really help in that department then the number three is uh, sponsor processing time. Amazingly, it's twice as long, at least, as the, the mandatory federal processing time. So the sponsors are taking twice as long in their part as the, the feds are mandated to take in, in, in their part. So what is that? We need to know. And some of it is probably exceedingly important to answer technical details or improve projects. But how much is self-inflicted? I think it would be really important for the industry to understand why this is taking so long. Why are we as sponsors taking so long? I know personally, I've made some mistakes that have probably aggravated that, you know, or dragged out the, the time frame. So I doubt that I'm the only sponsor that's that's done that. So there's some improvement there. And then the last one, and I'm sorry, I hope I'm not taking too long with this, but the last one is. Mitigation bank establishment is a team sport. And by that, I don't mean that the agencies are on one team and then the sponsors are on another team. That's not what I mean. It's a collective team sport. And so, so related to the timeliness of this, there can't be a, a your schedule and a my schedule. You cannot manage a project if there are these two different schedules. There has to be a mutually agreed upon schedule. Otherwise, there is no project management. And so to me, that's uh, something that probably factors into a lot of these areas. Probably it has something to do with the additional processing time. Again, a mutually agreed upon schedule would be would set the stage for us to coordinate our project management. I don't mean that this is that this should be pre-decisional about the project itself. That's not at all what I mean. You should reject projects if they are not meeting standards or objectives, and that should be done early. But all I'm saying is it would be powerful if we could coordinate the management of these projects. It would make such a huge difference. Part of that would be after action reviews. And so there's more I think that could be said about that, but I think I'm probably exhausted my time frame. So, so no, thank that's you. great, Greg. Thank you so much for that. I want to give Brian and Tom just a second to respond if there was anything that Greg said that you wanted to add to or respond to. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't come off mute for a minute. They wouldn't wouldn't stop being <laughs> read. Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't know if it's a direct response to to to, to Greg's comments, but I think it, it will be a little bit. So kind of the three things I wanted to talk about, and I mentioned, you know, what are we doing going forward? Some of the things that we laid out last fall and, and, and that are actually happening now is, is really focused on adding capacity, improving consistency and improving our method of tracking. Um, these and, and, and directly to one of those and I've been a couple of comments about how we maybe parse apart some of that that additional time and and I think that one of the projects that we're looking at with some of the bill funding is going to help there and that's the regulatory request system which we initially just an online application portal um, we're hoping to stand up phase one of that sometime this summer that will allow applicants to go in and do pre-applications and and some some permit uh, applications but down the road, phase three of that, which we'll get to hopefully by the fall or certainly early next year, will be transferring the mitigation information and, and that will automate some of our data entry. So, so we're hoping that the automation step reduces some of the data entry error. So when someone submits a piece of information, it's automatically logged into the system. So we're not depending on a project manager to dig back through emails and figure out what that right date was. 
when it comes in through that system, it'll automatically be entered. And, and the other thing that I think that'll do is add to our capability of being able to see even in that, you know, additional time space where, where the record sets at the time, because as we transfer information out, we'll know in that system as we receive information back in. So, so I think that'll get it some of that. Um, but just, to, to touch on a, a couple points under those other headings of so capacity, one thing that we have done with the bipartisan infrastructure law funding is, is get funds out to the districts directly to add staff. Um, as you mentioned early on, that, that is short-term money, so, so that money is, is available up until 2026. But our idea is there is we can show improvement, we can, we can use that money to, to to refigure our structure in the way that maybe works more efficiently, but we can also, for the time being, leverage against you know, future attrition to, to, to basically overhire staff right now um, at the district level. So if you know you've got somebody going out the door in a couple of years through retirement or attrition or whatever it may be, um, go ahead and hire their replacement now, whether than rather than the situation we've been in for years of having to wait till that person's gone and then going through a, a months long at best process to get someone else on board. So I think that sh that should help, and and today we've made two distributions to the districts, uh, one for last year, one for this year, a total of about twenty five million dollars. Um, we've been encouraging districts to use some of that funding to to, to hire or stand up mitigation focused staff or subject matter experts within the district. Um, we've also added capacity at our division level, which you know we've got eight divisions, thirty eight districts. Um, which is what we're calling a regional execution center. Unfortunate name, but that's what they settled on. Um, and and that, that capacity will be both project managers and subject matter experts. Uh, so we'll have capacity that a district, if they become overloaded, can pass work up to directly. And, and that includes mitigation bank processing. Uh, we'll also have staff that serve as, as regional and as a board national level subject matter experts on things like mitigation and ESA consultations that can have that communication across districts and kind of hopefully get to that other point that Greg raised about, you know, why, why are we seeing better processing times over here than over there as we're able to pull this group up. Um, for years, we've been reliant on subject matter experts down at the district level who also have 100 projects on their plate and it, it's just been difficult to get that cross pollination. This should make it better having that structure that can share that information up and, and, and across. Um, and then with consistency, you know, looking at uh, one of the things that we've done is set up these internal uh, webinar roundtables for mitigation where all those subject matter experts get together regularly. I think we've had, we started that in, in about mid-year 2022. We've had about seven or eight meetings so far. Um, where, where our folks can get together and talk about, hey, what are we seeing over here? What are we seeing over there? You know, what do we need to do next kind of questions? And again, getting at that point of, of hey, has somebody got a, a better mousetrap over there that we can all incorporate a, across the enterprise? Um, you know, we have some regional training courses that we've stood up. Uh, one thing that we're developing now, and I know we've talked a little bit with, with urban leadership about this, is this principles of delivery document. Um, someone mentioned early on, the, I think, uh, either Beck or Steve, about potentially developing a regulatory guidance letter, which still could happen, but to go through guidance letter, we've, we've now got to potentially go through rulemaking. It just takes a lot longer. So, so this is, we're calling this more of a, a focused collection of available information uh, that, that can be used by the districts and potentially the public to say, here's some of the thoughts maybe we should be having on a, on a national level to make this processing time better and to, and to get at some of these questions that are coming up. Um, and then the final thing uh, I already touched on a little bit is the tracking. We've got the RRS system coming online. Um, we have a renewed focus on looking at that metric. Uh, like I said, our, our performance has been not what we'd like it to be. And so, you know, what do we do to encourage districts to, to put mitigation bank processing on the same level as they would individual permits to focus on those things because some of the earlier slides uh, in the in the initial presentation I absolutely agree with there's although we're starting to see it trickle in now I think it's coming in slowly but we're going to get hit by a wave of these bipartisan infrastructure law projects 
and and mitigation is going to be a key piece of that. So we we realize that, and we know we need we need to to ramp up efforts. Um, so you know, do we start requiring reporting, upward reporting on older projects to try to get at what those delays are? You know, what are some things that we can do to focus districts on those metrics? Great, thank you so much. One of the thing, three of the things we heard in our study that were causing delays were staff capacity and training in the in the core and the IRT. So it sounds like a lot of what you're doing will address those three things. So that's great. Um, Brian, do you want to react to anything before we move? Yeah, I mean, I think in the training aspect and in the, the staff capacity, what we've been doing at EPA a lot is focusing on what tools can we can we help develop. Um, and so uh, Greg already mentioned it uh, over the last few years, we worked uh, a lot with contractor support and Steve uh, as, as one of the contractors working on it on developing the mitigation uh, bank and in lieu fee review workbooks. Uh, and, and we finally got those out and published uh, just last November. And so we really hope that those are a, a resource for um, the new staff coming in and, and perhaps, and also potentially useful for, you know, the staff that have been working together a long time in terms of organizing the information and organizing the reviews. Uh, and we're starting to, to, to work on a pilot to see what implementation aspects could be used by folks to to share the 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 comments collected in this organized fashion uh, for the review workbooks and the checklists to maybe make it more efficient uh, especially in terms of passing information back and forth um, and sharing information across IRT members so that when an issue gets raised and resolved, the next person who might inherit the project from the state or a turnout when there's turnover at a state um, or a federal agency can see how the issue was raised before and how it was resolved um, without having to, to kind of start over and take the whole group back through that process. Um, there, they are, you know, as kind of Tom mentioned, they're an example of a training document, of a, of a tool out there. It's available information that's out there. It's not new guidance. It doesn't provide any guidance um, or, or, you know, or new regulations, but it helps, uh, uh, hopefully will help folks organize and, and be more efficient in their review and their communication back and forth, which, uh, as Greg mentioned, might lead to more efficient project management um, and hopefully uh, better timelines there. You know, and, and as Tom mentioned, and, and as you just mentioned, Rebecca, training is always a need. Um, and uh, while we don't have the national at this time, the, the national uh, 404 focus compensatory mitigation court IRT course, um, there is uh, some work in the, in the conservation focused um, national course and, and incorporating more 404 and bringing a little more balance to that course. Uh, coming this year for those who want to come together and, and, and get a national perspective uh, from folks all over the country. Um, and, and at EPA, we, you know, COVID forced everything indoors and separate. Um, and we've, we're coming out of that solidly now, but we are just now kind of responding to uh, the renewed interest in training and the renewed hiring we're seeing in our regions with a lot of new staff that want the both the basic and the advanced courses and so we're just reevaluating what trainings are available for epa folks um and others and and seeing what we can offer and what we can pull together in terms of uh in-person trainings or virtual trainings or or more on the tools and resources side uh for everyone to use Great. I have one more question for all of you, but I just wanted to remind participants that you can, if you have a question, you can type that in now into the Q&A box and we'll get to those right after this one. But I want to do one last round and ask you if you could pick one single thing, what would that single change be that could be made now to improve um, or to make a difference in the timelines? And I'll start with Greg. Yeah, thanks, Rebecca. And I, I wanted to make a brief note that Brian, I, I think these workbooks and checklists could go beyond just influencing the, the IRT part of this. I think that 
sponsors should really pick those things up. They should use the checklists as their own internal checklists um, to make sure that they're before they submit that they've met these these requirements. So just just to follow on to to your your comment about that, using that as a tool. But Rebecca, the the main thing that I feel like, and I don't know exactly how to get here, but I think the main thing is to formalize what I'm what I've seen for many years. That there are folks that are very interested in mitigation. They really understand the importance of it. They many people, in fact, many people on this panel and and in the audience have been thought leaders in mitigation for many years. Some have influenced guidance. Some worked on the 2008 rule. Some continue to teach. So there's an amazing motivation and expertise uh, that that's we've seen leveraged at different levels. I, I just feel like there must be some way to formalize that at all levels of the core and IRT agencies. And Tom, what you, you just described sounds like you're moving, definitely moving in that direction. So that's super encouraging. But what I envision is that it, it might be, I don't want to use SWAT team because that <laughs> I don't want it to be violent, but uh, I, I'm thinking of an analogy of a surgical team, that they, that they are um, motivated, time is of the essence, they are proficient, technically proficient, and they coordinate ex exceedingly well together. I think we could we could take these steps that you're talking about, Tom, and and move um, concretely in that direction. Yeah, I don't know what we would call that, but I, I think if folks are not motivated, if they can't see the importance of doing good work and doing more of it and doing it faster, then I, I don't think they should be on these surgical teams that are being formed at uh, at different levels of of the agency so with that i'll, I'll leave it there hey awesome good idea um tom yeah um so i guess directly right to greg's point is you know i mentioned those regional centers and that expertise at that level you know, one of the things that we've talked about, not necessarily for mitigation banking, but could certainly bring it online is, is I'll call it a peer review, uh, putting that team together that can go around. And, and as you mentioned, where you've got districts that seem to have put something in place that's making a difference, having that group go in and, and, and look at a few of those files and then compare them to what they see in other districts and, and maybe bring that directly in. Um, in those other districts, I think is certainly something this structure will support. Um, but I guess backing up to, to, to offer answer to your question, I'm going to kind of take the easy way out, I think, because all of those things that I mentioned get at that issue of, of bettering this problem, hopefully. Um, I think one important piece is going to be this con the continued accountability. You know, I think as Greg pointed out, this report really shows us something and, and it teases it apart in a way that's that's not casting blame, but showing that we've all got a role here and that we can all improve in our own areas. And so continuing this type of discussion and, and maybe looking at, you know, ways to 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 collaborate in, in doing this review on a somewhat regular basis, not maybe monthly, but once a year you know, or so to see where where are we? Are we seeing the improvements that we thought we would see? Excellent. And Brian? Yeah, I, I I think I'd agree with Tom and, and say, yeah, we, we need to keep looking at this data and, and dig in deeper to see where, um, just just where and why certain things are working and what tools were they using or did they develop themselves? Uh, what resources did they have? How many templates and, and, and what was there that then can folks can develop that are appropriate for the, the other districts and, and for the other states and, and IRTs working. Um, but that all relies on us continuing to come back and look at this data and see how it changes over time. Um, that, that'll that be important to see, because especially with the, the numbers that we have here, especially on the Inloop B side, but even on the bank side, a lot of these are pretty small numbers for a pretty long time period. So that's, <laughs> there's a lot of stochasticity that can happen in there and a lot of, you know, very small differences, one or two projects that can change things a lot. So 
um, wanting to see lo long term and, and where the trend is going. So monitoring and adaptive management. Um, so we have some questions coming in. And um, I just wanted to point out in the Q&A box, you see that there's open and answered questions. So we have two open and then Sarah answered one question. So in case you don't see that in your box, you can click on that part. But um, the first question is about in the fee programs and given that they have the you know three year time clock that starts immediately when they sell their first advanced credit. The question was, is there any regulatory movement to prioritize in the fee projects to adhere to their timeline? Um, you know, in the review and approval process or and maybe at the broader question is you know is there any way is is there a way um to think about how those or the review and approval process for different kinds of projects come in and is there should there be a prioritization in those projects or are they you know first come first serve when the pile starts stacking up on the regulatory um uh the desk so, and somebody and i guess becca steve and sarah um Feel free to jump in on the questions if you have an answer to. So, does anyone want to take a first stab at that? So yeah, I guess I'll take this that first stab. Um, I think there is a prioritization in making sure that those in lieu fee programs are meeting their required timelines. Um, you know, because because it is that because it is an in lieu fee and and it's a, it's it's impacts in advance of the mitigation. I think it's very important ecologically that we make sure that they're providing what they're promising to provide. I'd like to add to what uh, Tom said or provide a little bit of a different perspective. I think it would behoove ILFs to look at how they are delivering compensatory mitigation projects. So many of them uh, are focusing on uh, designing, locating, building, and implementing the projects themselves. Uh, and there are models that have proven very effective, for instance, in uh, New England and North Carolina, uh, where uh, they're doing more of an RFP approach. And that seems better able to implement meaningful compensation on uh, much shorter time frames. Other thoughts? Maybe while we're here, I don't know, Steve and Becca, if you're thinking about digging more into the NLUFI data or would there need to be some upgrades before mm -hmm. that would happen? The, uh, the the project data uh, is problematic, and and it's because uh, different districts are entering in Luffy projects into ORM differently. Uh, so a lot of that wasn't captured uh, in the FOIA. Uh, one way to perhaps better address it might be to look at uh, multiple. Uh, approaches in a FOIA. Uh, obviously, that's that's going to be time consuming. That that would take uh, somebody at headquarters time and effort to basically do multiple queries, and it would be mean merging uh, potentially different data sets. Becca, do you want to answer the question that you in the Q and A about the link to the report? Yeah, sorry about that. I, I meant to just pop it in there, but uh, that didn't quite work. So yeah, the link <laughs> link worked for me, and I accidentally put the link in the host and panelists. So I will put that in the full chat. Sorry about that. Awesome, thanks. So you'll see that that um, pull up in the chat. Um, so another question was about state DOTs, and there's there anything that the state departments of transportation could could specifically do to help facilitate the process. Anyone want to take a stab at that one? Great. This is this is really a way out idea and probably doesn't make a ton of sense. So so with that caveat, <laughs> um, perhaps the DOTs could serve on the IRTs. And I, I know that by necessity, when you're building a road, 
you have to be excellent at project management. And so if they can bring some of that expertise to, to the IRT, then maybe that would be a, a positive role for them to play. I don't, there's probably better and, you know, other and better answers to that question, but it's just something that popped into my head. And I might just, I don't know how relevant this is to DOT, but I've been wanting to bring it up. So yeah, over in Virginia, they've uh, developed a permitting enhancement and evaluation platform called PEEP. Um, and in terms of project management, it just looks like a really wonderful model. Um, and I can share my screen real quick and just give you a, a look-see over here. Um, so you can you can bring up a, a project, any of their projects in the permitting pipeline. Um, they're sort of ramping up as they go along this year. Um, so I'm not quite sure at what stage they are, but they do have mitigation bank instruments there. Um, and then you can take a look at where it is in the process um, and which agency it's supposed to be with. So um, I don't know if that's relevant to DOT, but I mean, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful example. Agreed. Thanks, Becca. Any One more thoughts? thing on that. Yeah. Uh, at least in a number of uh, districts, uh, a number of states in the uh, in the Great Plains, uh, we've had folks from either federal highways or from DOTs providing technical support to IRTs. So not necessarily members of the IRT, but providing uh, technical support, for instance, in, in issues of uh, hydrology, uh, technical matters of that sort. Awesome. Oh, we'll keep putting your question as in. So I have a, um, a question about digging in a little bit to that additional time, but I'm also really curious about the sponsor time. and. And anyone can answer this, but but I'm wondering if Becca or Steve, did you look at like at either of those and try to um, figure out what's happening in those districts? I mean, are the sponsor times lower where they have templates, or is there something about those districts that you know helps speed along the process? The the next step, the the phase two that uh, we've uh, undertaken is basically a qualitative analysis. Uh, we have sampled uh, a number of uh, districts and reached out to uh, mitigation providers in that sample of districts uh, and conducted interviews with them to try and get at those questions uh, and that the data doesn't answer for us. Uh, issues of uh, staffing, issues of templates, processes, uh, project management tools, things of that nature. Uh, we do hope uh, to be able to conduct similar interviews with the mitigation providers counterparts of the districts. Yeah, and Steve's done a great job of tracking all of the SOPs and guidance and templates and things like that at each of the districts. So um, that can be one of the things that we, that we analyze is just seeing, you know, if is there a larger amount? Is there greater use based on what we hear in interviews? Um, and does that relate to that? Anyone else want to comment on that? Or Greg, do you have thoughts on that sponsor timeline? You've done some work in California. I think we have quite a few <laughs> templates and things out here. Is that something that you think helps speed up the timeline? Or what do you think is needed yeah. there? Yeah, thanks, Rebecca. I, I hope there aren't too many sponsors on, on the on the webinar because they're all sick of me harping on templates. And, <laughs> <laughs> and the reason for that is I've just personally seen the before and after of and, and it isn't just the templates, it's the, you know, it's the MOAs that that, that create the space for templates. And it, it's just the it's just the it's just clarifying expectations for the the sponsor. That's that's so important. If if we we sometimes compare ourselves to to Labrador retrievers or maybe it was golden retrievers. I'm not sure which, but in any event, to retrievers that 
if we can understand what the agencies need out of the system, then we're, we're just going to go chase that. We're, we're going to bring the best possible project, not that we're perfect. So I, I think that for us, templates at least help clarify what's needed in terms of some of those things like the instrument, the conservation easement, the um, long-term management plan, and probably missing financial assurances and probably missing something. So that's critically important. And again, I also want to just touch on this idea of a, of a shared project schedule, because I've seen a lot of power in the Sacramento district of having a shared. And what I mean by that is the sponsor may need to give up on, ironically, on maybe a component of the mandatory federal processing time. If the federal lead is saying, no, I just cannot do that because of I'm going to get training from Tom Walker on how to do that or Brian on how to do this better. Then, then the sponsor can say, oh, I, I, I get it. We're going to push the, the, that piece. We're going to push the review of the draft instrument back a couple of weeks. But, but then the, um, but then the sponsor becomes more clear about what their timing is going to be. And then that sets the stage to monitor, to track, and to adaptively manage to that agreed upon schedule. There's power in having an agreed upon schedule, not your schedule and my schedule. So I, I know I've said that before, but I, I've seen the power of that. And I think that's that may be something we think about in terms of a template. How do we how do we have a, an acceptable project schedule template, perhaps, that could be used um, to cooperatively manage these projects? Any thoughts, Brian or Tom? Well, I, I, I just I'll just say I, I, I share I share some of your passion for templates, um, and I, and I think you know it, where that template is developed as a collaborative effort with the mitigation providers, it's certainly valuable. Um, because while it may not contain that that schedule, which which uh, I like the idea of schedules as well, but it at least it, it manages expectations and makes it clear what everyone needs to bring. Um, so that, like you said, we're not we're not playing the game of I want to rock. Um, and, but you know, providers can come forward with the information that there needs to be in the template, which will make everybody's review easier. And this goes back to a comment, Steve, I think you made in the, in the beginning presentation, although I don't think this is quite the context you made it, that, that part about uh, the core eliminating the, the sponsor time frames from that metric. Um, I think one of the important things of having that measured is, is just reinforcing to districts that we're in this together and we all want to make this succeed because having those mitigation credits out there and available when it's appropriate to use makes, you know, makes a difference in our permitting as well. Um, and, and it makes a difference ecologically, the whole foundation of mitigation banks and being, you know, huge, meaningful projects. Um, so I think, you know, we want to keep that in there to some point so that that districts own a part of that and, and, and where some of those delays are, maybe for lack of clarity on what's needed, encourage the development of those templates or, or those you know, outlines or whatever that might be so that everybody understands what, what's needed from the beginning of the process. Great. Uh, one more, I think, question on this topic was, and I think maybe you answered this, Steve, but just to make sure, but there, is there any relationship between the length of agency review time and sponsor time by district? So are more questions, justifications being asked in some districts, but that's something you're going to dig into as you. Yeah, uh, what, we've, what we've seen so far is uh, no decided relationship between uh, agency processing time and uh, sponsor processing. Uh, and some districts that look really remarkable in terms of uh, uh, federal mandatory processing time uh, have very long additional processing. In other words, the back and forth between uh, the district and the core, uh, the district and the sponsor before the uh, prospectus or the draft instrument is determined complete. And then anecdotally in interviews, we are hearing there are some 
uh, sponsors who are spending a, a great amount of time that the, that's you know not even counted. It's sort of uh, even years leading up to submitting a prospectus. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure about that. Excellent. So there's a the next question is could the use of an OP law, which I don't know what that is, determination help where by agencies have to show results in a specific specific amount of time where a mitigation bank is de facto approved. Well, obviously at this point, uh, obviously at this point, there's no de facto approval process. Uh, it wasn't identified in the in in the mitigation regs. Uh, I'm not sure that you necessarily want that either. And I, I'll just add that uh, it sounds great from a sponsor's point of view, but I, I think it, it's really a, a major symptom of a dysfunctional um, dynamic. And and if we can't if we can't work on it together, get it to the finish line together, have it meet objectives, then then I, I think we failed. And I I just. I also don't know that it would be very supportive, supported by the folks that are actually writing the permits. So I, I just, you know, there, there may be other sponsors that disagree, but I, I think that's a, that's just a sign of dysfunction that might lead to further dysfunction and suppressed credit sales and so forth. Other thoughts? And I, and I think one of the aspects too is we don't want to in any way cause folks to question the use of the credits that are produced by the by by banks and in new fee programs we don't want to reopen the well was that a good credit we want to have the efficiency in the permitting process where the permits can say we're going to use this and if it's appropriate we get to that added efficiency on the permitting side um and and so if you start calling into question different types of credits produced by third parties, you, you might open up uh, Pandora's box. Thank you. I love this next question. Um, so the question is, how are the identified timeline issues influencing bank and in lieu fee sponsors' decisions? Is there something you can comment on? Have you seen or heard of, you know, change siting or design or in, uh, deciding not to pursue a project based on the timelines? We, we oh. have heard that in some interviews so far. Um, so just, and usually those um, increased timelines uh, have to do with sort of back and forth asking, asking for additional information. Um, and that can, that can mean it's not uh, it's not feasible anymore. There can also be, you know, negotiations about the credit determination that can make it economically infeasible as well. So, and uh, additionally, uh, staffing turnovers at the uh, district level can can be problematic in in at least some districts. Uh, we heard uh, from mitigation providers that uh, new uh, project managers would come in to replace those that had moved on to something else and often would want to go back and revisit previous decisions that had been made uh, about, say, uh, prospectus or completeness. Uh, to me, that that's potentially a matter of management. Can I also jump in and just say that we have heard from some in some interviews that things are going really well and that the project managers are just doing things really smoothly, keeping things on task. Um, so that, so there is there's a positive side too. <laughs> awesome. Thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, Greg or Tom, did you want to weigh in on how timelines might affect decision making? Are you saying investment decision making or just across the board decision making? I guess both. Yeah. Yeah, Tom, I'll leave it to you on, you know, on just overall decision making, what's, what's your perception? Um, so, I mean, from, from our standpoint of, of, you know, are we are we seeing delays in permit decisions that we can attribute to the lack of banking credit? Um, 
you know, I would say, and this is again, anecdotally, we may see that in pockets where you've got particularly busy uh, regions uh, within a district or, or, or within a division. But on the whole, I, I haven't sensed that as a, as a, as a delay or a problem. Um, you know, in, in terms of, of mitigation required, I mean, just in terms of permit numbers, so our, our, our numbers of permits issued is at least remaining fairly constant over the last few years. Um, we are seeing an uptick you know, every year, a little bit more, the separation between more banking credits and MMFE credits being used and less and less permittee specific mitigation. So just basically, once again, kind of anecdotally extrapolating from that, you know, I would say across the enterprise, I don't think it's a problem. But in certain areas, it certainly could be. Uh, and so you know, that may again be one of those places we want to focus to see you know, what, what, are, what are the concerns or what is leading to that and, and what can we import from another area that may have figured out how to solve those problems. For, for the investment side of the question, um, one thing we have heard when we've looked into and talked with folks with other programs, so whether it be nutrient water quality trading or conservation banking, um, we have heard from folks sometimes, you know, it's an investment decision of whether they go through the process to get approved right off the bat as a joint bank or we're gonna go through the 404 process first or this other process first to get approved because we're not quite sure how much longer if we do everything at once and, and we'll do one and then the other. And, I, and so we have heard that as more folks are exploring the, the, you know, the joint or, or multi-purpose banking approaches. And I'll just jump in there and say that there, um, I did hear one bank sponsor who, who shall not be named, who flamboyantly said, banking is dead. We're, we're just, you know, I'll never do another one. And, uh, but that person is still doing banks. So uh, <laughs> there is a point, though, where net present value uh, diminishes down to essentially zero. And it's, you know, if I remember, I'd somewhere around the 12 year mark. And so it, it's kind of a, you know, it's really a, a difficult decision and from an investment standpoint. And, and somebody might be incredibly impassioned to do a restoration project, mitigation bank or what have you, but maybe just feels like the risk is too great. And so in a way, it's not even the 225 days. It's whatever it comes to be, it's can we rely on that? So I would just... I would just add that. And then I did want to touch on Brian's uh, uh, comment about multi-purpose banks. And again, sponsors are sick of me talking about multi-purpose banks, but I'm going to forge ahead anyway. Um, the, the part of what to me is, is extraordinarily, uh, an extraordinarily good argument for templates is that, again, and I'm sorry, I, I'll, I'll just say the state that shall not be named, is using templates to approve uh, multi-purpose banks, species, and wetlands banks, in, and there's some state-level staffing issues right now, but it, it got to the point where it was a two-year process to approve a combined wetland and species bank. And so if we can do these multi-purpose banks in two years um, using these templates, then we can do that everywhere if we get these right, the, the right teams in place. Thank you so much. Um, we're nearing the end, but I wanted to just touch on um, as a last question, um, Sarah and Tom both brought up the, the regal process. And Sarah, I thought I'd just give you a few minutes if you, you mentioned it in the beginning, but if you wanted to add anything to your comments there. Yeah, thanks, Rebecca. So Herba put together a regal recommendation, which you can view on our website. Uh, we put it out back in April of 2021, and it really hit on a lot of the kind of common sense, just lessons learned, what we've seen that works well. Um, it le did lean heavily on, as Greg referenced, uh, the state that will not be named, uh, several of the practices that have worked well there. But we were really the, the motivation behind it was, is there a way for us to just institutionalize some of these basic kind of project management tools and, and 
communication expectations. Um, we've, we, we understand that the uh, process for approving a regal has changed over the years and it is a long um, it, it, it's a long journey from idea to ultimately seeing it issued out into the field and, and accepted. And so really, um, I'll just say Urba is extremely supportive of any guidance that the Corps puts out that focuses on how do we expedite and bring that predictability around core decision making under the mitigation program? So um, anything that's related to how do we deliver decisions faster and more predictably, uh, we're we're really supportive of. Uh, so that's I'll I'll stop there and uh, turn it to Tom or Rebecca. You, Tom, did you want to comment? Um, I, I mean, just to say, sort of reiterating what I said before, the principles of delivery is is something we started to develop based on on your your uh, product back in 2021. Uh, the idea of a regal is not a, a lost idea. And we, we haven't given up on it. We just have concentrated on getting this first. Um, and 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 then also, like I mentioned, putting in, in place these other parts once we got the bipartisan infrastructure law funding. Um, but but the Rego is still something that we could ultimately end up producing. I mean, and, and going through that more elaborate process does allow for much more public input and agency input and, and potentially make it a stronger guidance uh, if we are able to get there and it's needed. And Tom, I'm, I'm sorry if I missed it before. Do you have a timeline for the principles of delivery? No. No. Oh, the principle. Okay. I thought you, yeah. no, well, well, the principle of delivery. Yes, we do. The, the, the regal no. Um, uh, yeah. I'm going to go out on a limb and say we hope to be able to have it at least out to the districts, if not out to a larger distribution by you know, by the May timeframe, so that you know we hopefully we can tie it to some meaningful conversation at the May conference. Excellent. Making news. Great. Thank you. Um, well, I just wanted to thank the panel and um, thank you very much for all your insights and I'll hand it back to Sarah, Becca and Steve to wrap up. That's great. There was, um, hey Steve, if you can pop the link to that um, 2015 report it has lots of SOPs and templates. I'm looking for it, but I can't find it. <laughs> but if you can put that in there, that's great. Um, so thank you everyone for attending. We are, we're one minute to our time. Uh, we will post the recording on a YouTube site and uh, provide that to everyone who registered. And you can send that around to any colleagues and things like that. Um, so we appreciate it. We'll see uh, if anyone is going to the mitigation banking conference, we'll be there. Um, we'll be attending some other conferences as well, National Association of Wetland Managers and, and others. So um, hope to see any person. And if you have questions, um, let me just, uh, you're welcome to email any of us, I'm sure, but I'll, I'll provide you with our um, Steve and I's uh, emails so that you can see that. Um, all right, yeah. Um, and yeah, feel free to reach out to us if you have questions about the research and we can also direct you to other folks as well. So thank you very much. And we hope that, um, yeah, we hope we can move this forward into the future. So thanks everyone. Thank you all. Thank you. Great, thanks everybody. Okay, I'm gonna knock us all off. <laughs>